So hello and welcome along to isolation interviews for Hospital Radio Reading and for my YouTube channel and I am super super excited to be joined by acting royalty the amazingly talented Celia Emery thank you so much for giving up your time for me thank you Matthew well um, I've already said how marvelous I think you are um, to be able to give people in hospital who are stuck and sometimes the days are so long I do remember when I was a kid being in hospital um, so this is a, something wonderful that you're doing and if I can be part of it to cheer people up then I couldn't be more delighted. Oh it's such an honour to have you. As I say I mean I wanted to start off just by asking how has the last couple of years been for you? Obviously the pandemic has been tough for a lot of people but how, how have you been affected you know work-wise and, and in life? How has that, how has that been? Well um, I've absolutely hated it actually. Um, I but I have two nursing sisters who I think are angels. My father was a radiologist, actually, so I have a sort of medical background in the family. And I r really honestly do think that the nurses and doctors have been, well, I think they should all be knighted if there was such a thing. I mean, uh, uh, never mind the, the measly pay rise that they were offered, but I think that they're just quite wonderful. And I suppose um, no matter what, I was feeling with restriction on work and things um, I think the saddest thing and I'm sure you must agree is if people were alone in hospital and um, their families weren't allowed to come and see them I think that must have been very frightening and I think that is really the worst aspect of the whole pandemic. I mean, I think one thing that we can sort of, uh, that a lot of people have taken away from the pandemic is that things like, you know, Zoom, FaceTime um, have, have brought people together, although that human contact has been missed and people have missed just going and hugging a friend or a family member. So, I mean, have you enjoyed the kind of change in, in you know, technology and stuff like that? Or are you just, you know, want to get back to, to, to the norm, really? Well, of course, but, um, but you know, what would we have done without Zoom, actually? I mean, you know, had it been sort of 10 years ago, I don't think it had ever been invented, had it? So it hasn't half helped, um, you know, just to see people's faces, actually. It's one thing on the telephone, but to be able to, for me to see your face, for instance, and, um, uh, you know, it, it just makes all the difference, actually. And so, yes, I mean, the thing is, we've got to go with the times, haven't we? Um, this is the new invention. This is the way. Um, hopefully it won't be for always because there's nothing so good as um, having a hug with people. I don't think you can possibly, um, you know, uh, you can't make that anything other than it is. You can't uh, substitute it. Is that, That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> but um, hopefully things are going to get back. Um, I'm not quite sure when. None of us know. Excuse no. me. <laughs> But um, um, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, lockdown was, was long for a lot of people. Did you find yourself learning any new skills during the sort of the height of lockdown when, when we were all stuck at home? Yes, I did, actually. I started doing a mosaic, which um, I've never done before in my bathroom. And um, it was a marvellous, um, very fiddly, because it's only tiny little pieces of um, uh, mosaic that you put together and make a pattern. But um, yes, I never thought, never thought I wouldn't. Also, I'm not a great cook, but I found myself making bread and um, apple tarts and things. So um, you have to just get on with it because I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of um, this program with you because no matter what sort of hardship you might be going through, there are always people worse off. And um, I think the whole, um, you know, tedium and fright of being in hospital um is something huge and so you know here we are trying to lighten their day and that's marvelous now i wanted to go back to sort of where it all began for you i mean do you remember where the love of acting came from do you remember how that kind of became something you wanted to be a part of well i wanted to be a ballet dancer first of all um and i wanted to marry Nureff, rudolf Nureyev, but um i was too big and he was too gay so <laughs> that that couldn't happen um but i i did want to be a ballet dancer and i was a chorus girl for a long time actually um before i was um allowed to do a play i suppose i i loved doing it when i was tiny as well um i think i would never ever put anyone off 
because it's a wonderful life, but you have got to want to do it or die. That's the truth of it. Because it's, um, I love the uncertainty of it actually, um, not knowing what's gonna happen next. Um, um, and you know, I think that actors and actresses are very generous with each other because you know, we never know when we're all gonna meet up again. Um, and so I'm very lucky to be able to have followed my dream, I suppose. Yes, and still am. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, you sort of a well-accomplished actress. You've done so many amazing roles over the years. I mean, for you, is there a personal favourite? Is there one, a, a role or a series that you were part of that was as, you know, like a, a, a top, top uh, position, a top favourite for you? Well, um, I, I think um, the role of um, Mrs quickly in Nanny McPhee was a total delight because um, I got to be so horrible to Colin Firth, who I adore. <laughs> um, but, um, um, and I, of course, it was a dream job to go to India with the Exotic Marigold Hotel and have second helpings of that um, with the two dames. I mean, that was a, a really dream job. And I know that you were um, very keen on uh, Victoria Wood's work and I will be forever grateful to her because, um, you know, we had a, a, a wonderful working team for many years, which was, you know, I'm immensely proud of. So um, I can't really pick out the particular ones except what I've just said, um, because, you know, you never know what's coming around the corner and that might be even more wonderful. I mean, we I also, by the way, I don't know whether you um, watch, because it's slightly on different channels, but I've absolutely loved playing Pamela Adlon's batty mother in a programme called Better Things. Do you know of it? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you do? Oh, good. That gives me a licence to be really, really badly behaved, which is total joy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I wanted to take you back to, obviously, the, the days of uh, Dinner Ladies and, of course, Acorn Antiques and all that sort of thing. I mean, for you... Obviously, working on a show like that, I mean, for, we'll start off, of course, with, with Dinner Ladies, which was, you know, such a, a short run for, for a program, but it's been so popular. And I mean, I found myself watch, re-watching it um, in lockdown, and it just, it still stands the test of time today. Why, why do you think it is that people love it so much? Well, they do, don't they? And, and, and sometimes I, I tune into it and uh, have forgotten all the jokes that um, come in such quick succession, one after another. Um, Victoria was um, a great orchestrator of her work in a way, um, which meant that we were very quick fire. Um, we didn't hang about. Um, and so very often when it was um, played in front of an audience, you'd miss quite a few of the jokes because we'd be on to the next one, which is always rather thrilling, I think. Um, I suppose it's timeless, really. There will, or will always be dinner ladies. It was very simple, just one set. Um, but then, of course, she always had a very clever idea of, you know, uh, what did we do? Two series, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, and then and then leave it with people wanting more. That's always a a, a genius touch, actually, of which she was. Um, it's still hard to believe that she's not around, actually. I, I, I don't know about you, but it's sort of mad, isn't it? Um, I mean, yeah, and... like, you, like you say, it's, it's one of these things that she was taken way too young, and I feel that she had so much more to give. And obviously, it, it's a shame that we'll never see that. I know, I know. But she left a great legacy. So, you know, the fact that it cheered you up during lockdown, she would be thrilled, I know. Um, and I was immensely proud to be part of her team and i mean of course acorn antiques was a fantastic show and it was people loved it because it was so 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 you know so bad that it was good if that makes sense i mean that obviously you know a, a, a drama which was meant to be awful but it, it was so addictive well it was a very clever idea i mean i i suppose i we never played it in front of an audience which is quite a big clue because we had to be very, very straight, um, you know, straight faced, like me particularly, because my character wanted the whole thing to go right and got very worried when my telephone would not stop ringing when I picked up the receiver. So I had to bash it, you know, and, um, you know, when Julie Walters came in with the wrong cue, you know, I mean, it was, it was uh, delicious, but we really did have to keep our, 
uh, uh, concentration and keep straight faced about it all. Um, but it, it was wonderful to be a part of. At one point, ridiculously, um, I thought perhaps Victoria thought that I was an awful sort of rep actress, so I'd be perfect for this part. But um, happily, she gave me lots of other roles. So, um, but I'm very proud of Miss Babs. Of course, I am. And I mean, with, with a show like that, obviously, I imagine it must take a while to film because, like you say, if you keep, you know, keep getting put off or keep, um, you know, sort of end up, you know, falling into fits of laughter, I imagine it took a while to film. Well, um, Victoria was very strict, as was our director, Jeff Bosner. Um, and so I think the fact that we did it in a studio without an audience um, the day before the live show, we... Um, got through it much quicker than we might have done. Um, I do remember on the same subject um, that when Duncan and I were the customers in um, the sketch about two soups, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, with Julie Waters playing the most marvelous old waitress I've ever witnessed. Now, we never ever got through that in rehearsals because we knew she was gonna take hours coming through those swing doors we knew that we didn't dare look but i'm afraid to say duncan and i couldn't stop laughing all the way through rehearsals but come the day of the audience we had to you know uh, and if you watch carefully you'll see that i'm biting the inside of my lips so much so that there's actually blood in my mouth because woe betide either of us to have wrecked it by laughing and uh so, you know, there was a certain amount of discipline um, involved, of course, in order to make it work. I mean, I imagine, I imagine when you first read the scripts, I mean, did, did, I, I'm not sure if I read this right, but when you first read the scripts, were, were you a bit like, oh, that doesn't sound like it's going to work and everything. But obviously, once it came alive and once it was being performed, you completely understood where, where it was going. Well, I do remember um, a cameraman filming Acorn Antiques. And it was a seven minute sketch at the end of quite a slick show of different sketches, Victoria Wood as seen on TV. And so when it came to Acon Antiques, I can remember watching his face thinking, what on earth is this? I don't understand why are they, you know, knocking into the furniture and bashing into the sound boom and forgetting their lines. Well, I don't understand it. And he was so perplexed by what we were doing. But by the end of the season, he was pushing his camera up Duncan Preston's nose and crashing into um, scenery. I mean, it'll amuse you to know that um, I had the same two customers in every single program. The same two customers who, by the way, never bought anything. And there were little things like that that you wouldn't have noticed until we got to sort of the program seven, you know, and it was just, it was very subtle actually, but um, genius. <laughs> now, I mean, obviously so many roles that we can talk about. I mean, I wanted to also briefly mention uh, Keeping Faith, which obviously you appeared in the final series of, which was fantastic. Eve Miles is amazing. It must've been fun to go in as her kind of very evil mother. That must've been quite a fun uh, job to do. Absolutely it was. How clever of you, Matthew. Well. Um, you know, I've fought quite hard during my work to try and switch up what I'm going to do next. But the idea of somebody giving me such, um, you see, the thing is when you, I, I remember Laurence Olivier says, you've always got to love the person you're playing, which is a very good piece of advice, actually. So actually, I loved Rose. I saw her point of view, but to the world, I guess she was evil. And so I did have the chance to you know, wield a gun and be really quite horrible. Um, but of course, that's the whole point of acting. And it was quite surprising, I think, to people that I could be so vile. <laughs> that's the thing is, obviously, you know, when but it was, well, I was gonna say, obviously, you know, getting to play, um, you know, quite, you know, so many different characters over the years, yet, I don't think we've ever really got to see you playing, you know, such a baddie. So that must have been quite fun to, to do that. It uh, was, absolutely. And I'm hoping that there's going to be some more baddies around the corner. Yes, because it's, um, it's marvellous to surprise people. It's the whole point, really. 
So yes, watch out, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> now, a film which I also found myself watching um, during uh, lockdown, which is a feel-good film, it's so good, was, of course, Finding Your Feet, which is a great film. I loved it. Obviously, yourself, Joanna Lumley, an amazing cast. Um, that must have been a lot of fun to film. I mean, I mean, how, how did that come about for you? How did you become involved in that? Well, um, marvellous director, Richard Greatrex, um, uh, who I did a part in a film called The Gathering Storm, where Al Albert Finney played Winston Churchill. And it was Ronnie Barker coming back out of retirement after 14 years playing his butler. It was a wonderful um, opportunity. And so he asked me to be in this. And apparently um, the part was written for me, which is terribly flattering. But as with London Buses, I was already doing um, King Lear with Glenda Jackson playing King Lear aged 80. Can you believe that? At the Old Vic. And I played her eldest daughter, Goneril. So in the, day uh, in the daytime, I was filming Finding Your Feet. And on the first day we filmed, which was the night after the first night of King Lear, um, we were filming outside of London. And so I had to get on the back of a police motorbike. Um, I, when I say police motorbike, I mean he was an ex-policeman who was driving me um, in order to get me back to London, 46 miles away, um, to do the evening show. And I can remember being so tired. I, About five occasions, I nearly slipped off the bike and fell asleep. Oh, no. And I said to the driver, I, I feel as if I'm falling asleep. And he said, yes, I often feel like that when I'm driving. <laughs> um, so that was quite hairy actually during the filming of that but yes it was it was wonderful because it it did give people well the opportunity to take a leap of faith that's what the message is isn't it um and dancing is my great love so it was a, a joy absolute joy I mean, I imagine because you sort of, I, I imagine at your point uh, in your career is that you're, you're being offered so many different roles. So how, how do you decide kind of which ones to go for? I mean, is there kind of a process for you of like, you know, sort of what sort of things you enjoy doing more or, or how, how do you decide? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, at the moment, um, very often, um, I think maybe because of um, Phil, the mother that I play in Better Things. Um, there are parts written um, for, you know, people of my age having Alzheimer's. Now, it's a, it's a very difficult um, illness to deal with. And I feel very um, sad for children who have to look after their parents and things. But I have to say, um, I hope I'm not there yet. So I don't want to um, play somebody in an old people's home yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's got a sense of humor and, you know, or if I can play a different aspect of myself, fine. But um, yeah, it, it is tricky to know how to choose. But somebody once said, funnily enough, I was buying a, um, a pair of earrings for the premiere of Calendar Girls. Do you remember that film? Yes, yes, yes. And they were very expensive and very sort of um, uh, decorative. And the girl said to me, my mother always used to say, if they make your heart sing, buy them. They did, and I did. And I love them, and I wear them whenever I can. So I try to use that with a part. Um, and if it makes my heart sing, then um, I will jump on it because I love to work and I love to do different things. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky moment choosing. It is. Yeah. And I imagine as well, because you've got, you know, that, that amazing skill of being able to do, you know, comedy, but also being able to do straight acting. It must be fun to kind of go between the two. And I imagine when you've got all that choice and also, you know, sort of, you know, the, the choice of films and TV, that must be a, a great honor to know that there's, you know, people that want to work with you and that, and that people love to, to, to watch what you're doing. Of course. I mean, I sort of can't believe my luck, but nevertheless, when all is said and done, laughter gets us through life, doesn't it? I mean, 
I think it's such an important thing. And I actually think um, that it should be put on the national health. I think it's such a healing process. I really do. So my heart goes towards anything to make people laugh, of course. I like to surprise people by being horrible, but um, to make people laugh, I think it's the most marvelous sound um, I can ever remember, particularly from a great big audience. Actually, I wanted to show you also, Mikey, this, mar oh, you can't really see it actually in this, um, I don't know, it's a rose quartz oh, yeah, yeah. Um, salt lamp that um, my son's girlfriend gave me. And it's so marvelous because to me, it's like a healer as well. And anything that you can get, you know, from, um, look at these marvelous, and, and I'm showing this because hopefully your um the patients will enjoy them you know beautiful white tulips um you know anything that you know is not necessarily pills but you know part of nature that can lift your spirits um i i'm all for i mean i say there's so many amazing things that can bring light to people's lives and and don't cost much you know i mean like like you say a bunch of flowers or you know, sometimes even just going out for a nice walk in, in nature and with, with, you know, the fresh air and, and amazing views. Because the UK, people forget the UK has some amazing views and some amazing places to go. Um, I mean, where are maybe yes. some of your favourites to, to visit? Well, of course, um, my father was from Glasgow and um, I'm very, very proud of my Scottish roots. Um, and I love going to Scotland. I haven't been for a little while. Um, I'm very near a park here in London and I make myself go, I don't make myself, but I, I enjoy to go for a walk every day. I think it's terribly important to keep moving. And, um, you know, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're very lucky. I mean, when you think of, sorry to be sort of a bit dramatic, but if you think of the sort of misery of the poor people in Afghanistan, it, you know, you just have to take a, a moment to reflect how lucky we are really and yes the pandemic has been ghastly but it's not like the war zones that people in the world have had to suffer you know now i mean another say so you mentioned it briefly obviously before calendar girls i mean i imagine when you get films like that because for anyone that doesn't know obviously it was a true story um and it obviously you know it was a calendar that was made um, when you are doing those scenes where you do have to kind of bear rule, is that a scary thing for you? Did you did you enjoy that or was that petrifying? Ghastly, Matthew. It really was. And I was first. But it was funny. I was thinking about it on my walk the other day. I was actually very glad for once in my life to be the age that I was at that time. It's a while ago now, actually. But suddenly I thought, well, if I'd been any younger... The same applies to Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, actually. If I'd been any younger, I wouldn't have been in the running for the films. Um, so for that reason, I was um, uh, very lucky at that moment. But, oh God, yes, having to take my... I don't like taking my clothes off in front of myself, let alone anybody else. So, however, knowing what the true story was about and knowing what the whole calendar depicted... I knew jolly well I wasn't to make a fuss when the day came, and I was the first. I had to jolly well get on with it. Um, that's not to say that we didn't have um, champagne and twiglets in my dressing room afterwards. We did. <laughs> we always did. Um, but no, of course it was uh, it was scary. But you know we were a team, and it would have been very bad form to make a fuss when these marvelous real women did the brave thing so we had to jolly well get on with it um and in i don't know how much you watched of better things but um pamela adlon who um writes the series um gave me the part of playing her mother who is you know notoriously badly behaved including if i tell you this um her real mother lives next door you see so she said to me one day do you know i saw i looked out of the window and i saw my mother pruning her roses with no clothes on and I said, oh, then one day in the makeup room, she said, Seagulls, you know, I told you about my mother pruning her roses with no clothes on. Well, I'd like to film that today. So we did. <laughs> you can't really see anything, thankfully, but I was brave enough to do it because it's all part of it. 
I mean, and then become somebody else. I was going to say, obviously, you know, having had such an amazing career, are there times, you know, other times in your career that you've had to do something and been petrified? Any sort of experiences or things you've had to do during filming that you just, you didn't want to do, but you sort of had to? Well, it's certainly one of them, yes. But you just had to get on with it. I think there was a, there was a time in, um, there was a time in a play in London where I had to go right up high on a platform um and i was a bit scared of heights there's that um i remember in i don't know if anybody remembers the borrowers um uh do you remember that film were you yes too young yeah no i remember it watched it at school that was one of those play, uh, sort of films we watched at school yes i mean this is not to say that i i minded doing these sort of stunts however there was a moment when um i had to come down a rope um, and I just at that moment completely forgot to do hand over hand over hand over hand and I just went like that. And, oof, Ooh. The inside of my hands, I mean, they blistered and burnt. But, you know, you do these things. You just do. And it's sometimes it's quite fun to do your own stunts. You know, I, I so admire the men and women who do. My God. <laughs> And I mean, having, you know, obviously getting to travel the world with, you know, when you do premieres and when you're filming even, are there places that you've maybe not had the chance to visit that you would love to? Or are there places that you have visited and you've not really got to explore them and you would love to go back in the future? So lucky. Um, I don't know if you saw um, Happy Ever After, but we went to Bulgaria to film that with David Williams. You know, when would I ever have thought in my life that I would be going to Bulgaria and also I don't like to fly so I went across on various different trains which was marvelous. Um, when we filmed uh, the Titanic, Julian Fellows' Titanic on television, we went to Budapest because that's where there's an inside water um, studio. Um, going to India and everything. I've never been to China or Japan and I've never been to South America. Um, but gosh, we are lucky to to be able to go around the world, and and it is marvelous if you get days off to go and explore. Of course, you know. I, mean, um, I was going to say when you obviously get to go and explore and everything. But maybe where's the sort of the strangest place you've been recognised? Because I imagine you know, kind of wherever you go, people recognise you and know who you are. Where's the strangest place you've been recognised? <laughs> Well, I think I was very surprised. It's not particularly strange, but the first time I went to America, um, I got into a lift and the man next to me said, oh my God, Claudia Bing, you know, Bing, Bing and Bing, um, the absolutely fabulous character that I played. And I was very surprised, but interestingly, Absolutely Fabulous has really um, traveled across the ocean because I suppose everybody understands excess. Uh, drinking and smoking and <laughs> um, and bad behaviour. So um, that was quite surprising. Um, and uh, um, in in France, once I was going up an escalator, and uh, the, the lady said that she loved the Indian Palace, as it was called in France. Um, so I, I mean, I do get an absolute thrill from being recognised. I do. It happens more if I'm wearing lipstick. <laughs> I've discovered. And are you a fan of now the fact that people are moving away from autographs, it's now going to selfies? Is that something you like or, or are you not so keen? I don't mind really. I mean, uh, I don't, I, it's rare to look really good on a selfie, <clears throat> I, I conclude. But um, what the heck, it, uh, you know. Um, you know, if it wasn't for our fans, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, I know sometimes it can be a little bit awkward if you're uh, maybe in the middle of an argument or not having a very nice day, but, you know, we, you know, we are sort of made by our fans. So, you know, it doesn't hurt. Now, I just want to say before we go, it's been a pleasure talking to you. But, but first, I mean, any messages you'd like to give to anyone who's currently in hospital at the moment, not having the best of times, is there anything you'd like to say to them? Yes, I mean, um, I think we, we, we must thank Matthew for giving up his time volunteering for this marvellous programme. I'm very honoured to be part of it. I hope you can have a bit of a laugh from our um, 
conversation. Um, and I know how slowly the hours go. Um, I can remember thinking, you know, 12 o'clock comes around and it's lunch. And then there's a very, very long time, you know, in the afternoon, especially if you don't have any visitors. So I'm thinking of you all. Um, I hope you can have you know, maybe a book or a friend in the hospital bed next door. I think the nurses and doctors are angels. I truly do. All the work they do, and I'm sure that they will spend time with you if they can. Um, and don't worry, it's not forever. And count the days, and soon you'll be home, I hope. Um, but try to keep your spirits up if you can. Have a laugh. Um, hopefully you can watch some television and get to you know um see something that um, amuses you or listen to music that's what i've been doing this morning um so that you can be inspired to get up and dance soon um but i wish you very well and remember it's not forever it's only for a, hopefully a little time and you'll be back and enjoying your life thank you so much celia it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to speak with you um of course keep safe and you're welcome back anytime Thank you. And I applaud you, Matthew. I think you're a wonderful man. And we all thank you for giving us this.